Um, it is funny. I, I remember one time as I was growing up in church, there was this guy, Joe Thurman was his name, and he was battling sleep. He was sitting there, and it became actually so distracting for the pastor. He was t- and his head was like bouncing, like constantly, and we started to count it. Uh, because it was, and, and, and uh, nobody woke him up. I wasn't close enough to throw anything at him or anything. So it was, it was one of those things where, and so there, and there have been times where I've caught some of you. <laughs> and so I will now reveal the list. No, I'm kidding. So, um, but it, but it, is, it, is, it is interesting when you are battling it, if you've ever done that when you're driving. When you're battling sleep, I remember there's been times where I was literally slapping my face, rolling down the window, and playing Van Halen as loud as I could. Okay. Anything to stay awake. The Bible has things to say about sleep. Let me look, let's just look at some of those verses because I think that it, it, God, obviously, as, as Dave mentioned, He puts in His Word what He puts in His Word for us to have understanding. So, this is a uh, different verses that have to do with different aspects concerning sleep. One aspect is talking about comfort, Psalm 4, verse 8. Psalm 4, verse 8. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you, O Lord, uh, you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Isn't there a beauty to when you know that you are safe? Sometimes as parents, it's knowing that your kids are under your roof and you know that they're safe, that you can now sleep, okay? Uh, but for you to just settle down and go, okay, I am in a, in a safe place, I can now sleep. Um, God doesn't sleep. That's good news. Psalm 121, 3 and 4. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And so it's so good to know that God never sleeps. He doesn't need to. He, um, in fact, when he rested, he didn't need to rest. He wasn't tired in, on the seventh day. He rested as a way of teaching us something to say, I need, know that you need rest, and so I need you to do that. Um, but then there's problems with somebody, uh, the book of Proverbs has verses about wisdom and talking about someone who sleeps too much or um, uh, is uh, slothful. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. And so God gives warnings concerning those that sleep too much that uh, there's going to be things that are going to happen if you do that. Um, and then God also provides his words through another wisdom book in Ecclesiastes talking about the whole balance of sleep, um, someone that takes it to an extreme and then someone that needs to um, rest in it. Sweet is the sleep of a ra- laborer. So God knows after you've done a hard day's work, showered up, got, got to bed, it is one of those things where you can, okay, this is sweet. I did what I was supposed to today. Whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let them sleep. And so somebody that, and it's talking, I believe there, of a rich person that isn't acqu- accumulating his riches in a, in a good way. It is in a way that uh, would not be pleasing to God. And then lastly, a, a letter, uh, Paul, writing to Thessalonians, writes here in 5, verses 5 through 11, the call of the Christian, the call of the Christian. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. But since you belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. It's interesting, I, as a parent, and I look at just how times go and, and things along that line, and I'll hear in the news, I don't know how often you hear about these athletes that are up, and it's like 2 in the morning, and they left a club, and somebody gets shot, or something happens. And they're like, this is shocking. Something bad happening at 2 in the morning. I, I, I try to encourage 
young people, are trying, nothing really good happens. It's one of those things where if you're out and you aren't supposed to be in this place, um, let's not be shocked when something bad happens. God has provided opportunities. I know there's people that work nights. I understand that. That's not what we're talking about here. There are times that God says, I want you to get some sleep. And so I kind of want to admonish you in that area. If that's something that you, there's sleeplessness, there might be something that, something's going on. Um, but I want to encourage, come alongside parents and encourage you young people, please get the sleep that you need to get because um, it's, it's just so important. What we see here, I know this isn't a message concerning sleep, but it's, a con, it's concerning, a, a, it talks in a story here about uh, something that happens with this young man. But I want you to think spiritually where we're at. We, I remember a little while back we had the, I had a, uh, the alarm clocks going off, if you remember that sermon a little while back. And God wants us to, to be awake and to think seriously concerning this Christian life, that we wouldn't just coast through our Christian life, that, that we wouldn't just, you know, I, I'm, hey, I'm here. I, 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 I'm here. I could be a bunch of other places. Amen. But I believe that God has called us to being awake and aware of what is around us. Awake and aware of what's going on in our family's life. Awake and aware of what's going on in our, in our um, friends' lives. Awake and aware of what God desires to, how he wants to use us for his glory. And so let's get back into this context again as we're confronting this spiritual narcolepsy that can creep in. And, and what, can, what can we do after we diagnose that and said, hey, this is something that could be a possibility in my life that, that I'm just sleeping through this thing called the Christian life. I'm just, I'm just putting my time in. He's called us to more. He's called us to more in our relationships. He's called us to more in our walk. So first point, first point, what would help us with that? Well, first thing I think that would help is we must meet. I, I don't think you're here by accident. I don't think you being here in church is, is a bad thing at all. Um, we, I think we should, church never ends, by the way. I remember hearing a song that said, um, we can't go to church, we are the church. I'm, I'm, I'm the church tomorrow morning. I'm the church. And it's not just because I'm the pastor. You are too if you're a, a, a child of God. You're the church. You bring Jesus with you. But there is a point where the, the church family gathers, and we do that this, this, on Sunday here. Look at verse 7 again. He says here, On the first day of the week, and remember a, a change has been made, when we were gathered together to break be- bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Christianity had moved worship to Sunday, uh, a shift from Saturday the Saturday of Judaism. Uh, the Sabbath is not today. You do know that. S- the Sabbath day is Saturday. If you go to Israel, uh, in fact, I had opportunity to do that a little over 10 years ago. Uh, yesterday, uh, it almost seems like a ghost town at points as I would walk around. Uh, people are resting. They take that seriously. They are not working on that day. Um, there are some that are doing what they have to do because there's tourists. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're, especially the Orthodox Jews, they're holding to that. And so there's a shift. And remember, the shift is hard. Remember, we talked about the shift from Judaism to Christianity. It took a long time. Even Paul made a vow that was Jewish. And so they would gather together on this first day, and they're gathered together to break bread, the, the host of the, the meal. And that's the start of the meal. That's when it was known that he would take it, and it, it was just done, break bread. Okay, now we can eat. And they would gather, and they would gather and spend that time together, have communion. Um, I've grown up in a tradition that relegated communion to just church time together like this. In fact, I, I've worked with different leaders that have said to me, you know, they really shouldn't have communion outside of this local body. And the more I'm studying the scripture, and then you've got to have an ordained minister do it. And I'm going, 
hmm, but the problem is I, don't, I haven't read that in the Bible. And some of the most powerful times that Bob Spoonster has experienced in jail ministry is when they experience communion there. And some of you might even be like, um, oh, I don't know, this could get scary because a shift happened actually in, the church, in church history. They, they started to make um, communion this thing full of ritual and so it was like high and holy and it's, it is a holy thing. But do you realize that it was tied to common meals in homes where people would have communion and it would start their meal off or end their meal. But the focus was we are Christians and we are spending this time together. And Jesus used something as basic as bread and the cup. And it was a way to make people be God conscious in the church. And some of you, I don't know if you ever get together like this. You get together and you've ta- you talk about everything. I do this. We talk about everything but God. And after you drive away, and you were with Christians, you drive away and you were talking about Susie and how she is interesting. And how Uncle Frank, Uncle Frank, isn't he a winner? And you could go on, or the Cardinals, or this, or that. And you talk about everything but Christ. But maybe some of you in your homes, dads, maybe some in your homes could say, you know what, I, I want to do this. This could be a really cool thing. I want to spend some time and I actually want to think about this thing called communion. Because there's, there's the idea of confession and there's the idea of Jesus coming up and there's the idea of love and there's the idea of forgiveness. And what was, what's really cool about it is maybe it would guide our conversations a little bit differently. Does that make sense? Now, some of you are like, now this is scary. But if it gets out of whack, isn't it interesting that 1 Corinthians starts talking about it? Because what started happening is it got to the point where they would have these, what they called love feasts, as they would get together, and people were doing communion, and it was in a way that would not honor God. People were being selfish in it and, and conversations, and they were taking it unworthily. They weren't taking it seriously. And Paul said, this is serious business, what you're doing. And so I just want to encourage you to think about that more, that as we gather around this, it's a holy moment, it's a special moment, but I, don't, I do not believe that he relegated it to, to say, and by the way, it only is done here. Because if, if you started doing it and it was something that you took, didn't take seriously and it was flippant and things along the way, God will take care of that. He says in his word he would. God takes care of that stuff. But what could happen if we started taking God so seriously that we go, you know what? He, he did this bread and cup thing and, and he did it because he picked basic things of life so that you and I would start to become a little more God conscious. Just something to think about. And I, and I see that they're in this home here, and they're doing that, but they, they're gathering together. He says here in the Word, he says, He talked with them, dialegomai, dialogue. He did not stop preaching. He was about to leave on a long, difficult journey, yet he loved ministry. I love this man's heart. He... He, he knows that he's about to leave, and it's good that he's probably packed and he's prepared. But he sees a group of people here that needs ministry, needs people, needs, he needs to feed them, because that's one of his calling, and feeding is teaching them. And so he's going to spend time talking with them about God. I'll tell you, you ever meet people, and they're just hungry for the Word. They just can't get enough of it. The early church seemed to be a place that was like all you could do to get them out of the building. Sometimes our church, not grace, but I think the church of today is what can we do to get people in the building? Well, if there's a hunger for the Lord, you want to learn. You just start coming for it. It's like, I need this meal. I need it. And by the way, if that isn't your heart, if, you have, if your heart isn't something where it's like, you know, I want to learn things concerning, take Take note of that. I'm talking about in your personal life, in your walk. He says, as, as babies desire the sincere milk of the word. 
I, have you ever met a baby that when they're hungry, we don't know about it? It's not, it's not one of these things, boy, I wish. That, if there was a baby that's like, this baby needs to eat. It doesn't like food. We'd go, red flag. There'd be concerns. But we might just excuse that for brothers and sisters in Christ. They don't seem to have an interest. Well, that's some people are like, we're all babies. We're all still growing. There should be some desire there. And you see this in the early church. They're up till they're up till midnight. And I thought, let's start it here today. Amen. We're going to midnight, folks. <laughs> or at least twelve. <laughs> but seriously, it just seems to be to it's pulling teeth sometimes. Thank you so much for being here. Let's continue to pray that we would have that desire, that hunger. Uh, for the word. Let's look at verse 8. He goes, and so Luke, in writing here, he's trying to explain some things. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. Now, lamps being lit, and God puts things in his word so we'd have understanding. Something that was going on with the early church that they were being accused of is they would get together in these secret clandestine meetings, and they would have these things going on, and they, they, they're, going, they're cannibals. No, seriously, that was something that was said because Jesus said, my body and blood, and they go, these people are cannibals. Or they were doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing in the dark. And so by the Holy Spirit, he puts in there, just so you know, they're in this room and it's, it's on the third floor. Lamps are lit. It's bright. So we have an understanding, okay, that's one thing that's going on. They aren't meeting uh, in these secret meetings doing things they shouldn't be doing. So God, by His Spirit, puts that in the Word. But also, it might explain what happens later because these oil lamps are being lit, and, and I don't know how much, um, what's the word where there needs to be air movement in a room? Yeah, that word. And um, what would be going on is they're, 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 this room would be full of this, and this young man that we're going to be looking at in a moment here, he got a, it seems like he got a pretty good seat because there's some ventilation, ventilation, thank you, um, were uh, coming through there, and so he's able to have this window open, which wasn't necessarily glass, maybe a lattice, something that was blocked, and they'd have it open there, and he'd be sitting there, and so he's got the cross, cross breeze. Maybe he's one of these guys that's looking out the window, a little distracted. I know that never goes on here. That's why we made these uh, frosted, because we know how evil you are. And um, so, amen. And, um, but it, this explains, these lamps being lit, it explains that a room full of fumes and smoke. That could lend itself to somebody, and let alone a guy talk until midnight. Because you know, not necessarily everybody in the room is loving it. Maybe there are some kids that are sitting there going, I can't believe it was there. we we got to believe that the early church probably looked like us a little bit at times, that, that we have all different interest levels in the room, whatever the case, but they're all in there. And that's what's going on. Second point, we don't just... Um, we not, we, it's not just we must meet, but secondly, we see miracles. This is what needs to go on for us to wake up a little bit. We need to see God working. Uh, this is a mir miraculous time here, but he's still doing so. He's changing lives. I um, just met with a young man on Thursday lunch who has a heart for um, ministry. This man, young man's been here. We get, we've supported him uh, on a trip or two. He doesn't attend this church. But his heart's desire is to work at Kansas State University in the fraternity. He was just meeting that morning because I com he comes into McDonald's and I'm seeing him. And this guy is usually kind of cheerful and stuff. He just has that disposition. Went to Warrenton High School, um, just attended Missouri Baptist. Has a has like a kind of a sports management degree, but has such a heart for God that he doesn't want to do that. He wants to do this. And amen if somebody wants to do that. He just wanted to share with me what's going on in his life. So I'm sitting across from him, and I go, what's up? He just seemed kind of bummed out. You hug the guy, and he just seemed like he had stuff on his mind. Oh, I just met with a guy, a friend, who's in the gay lifestyle. 
and claims Christianity. And his heart's breaking. His heart is just breaking. Because he says there is so much to, to just, you know, specifically that issue. That issue seems to be hammered constantly. It just seems to be, it's, it's one way or another. That issue's hammered. And the beauty of what this young man was saying to me is he wasn't saying, because, because you can't put those two together and act like everything's okay. And by the way, as time goes by, I'm meeting more and more Christians that are kind of tired of this battle. They've kind of given up. You sure that it's okay with God or not okay with God? They're tired. It isn't okay with God. Okay, now, here's the beauty of when I was talking to him. But my sexual sin isn't beauty, beautiful or okay with God either. Because you, can, you, can, you and I can say if, if I'm um, thought life... If there's a couple that is not married and just, well, we're, we're not gay, but we're doing this. Sexual sin is sexual sin. Amen? Get so quiet. I mean, last week I was talking in Sunday school and I was talking about the whole idea of living together. And I'm just saying it out of love. Love, living together is a marriage killer. Amen? I'm talking... I'm, seeing, I'm f- feeling like nowadays I'm saying certain things and it's not, hey man, you don't want, I know you don't want to scream it. And it's not necessarily that I'm looking for that. But I'm, sometimes I'm looking at some of you and I'm going, do we really believe this or are we buying it? Are we buying it that you don't know how many of my friends are, and, I, and by the way, I love these people too. I've got family members that are, this is the deal. And so I'll say to a couple that's living together, if, if they love each other and, and they believe it, I'm going to say to them, um, something's got to happen here. I'll, ma- I'll do your wedding. Quick. Because the Bible also says it's mar- better to marry than to burn. Or maybe you shouldn't be together. Boy, it's getting quiet. And we as family, you sometimes, and, and I, these pe- I love them. These are hard things to say, and it's not going to get any easier. What was so beautiful talking about this with this young man is his heart broke, and he wasn't being judgmental. He was saying, and this is what God did for me. I repented, and then I I found the grace of God. And he changes lives, and Christ makes it possible. Amen? Amen? And it isn't, okay, I'm going to try a little bit harder. I'm gonna... Jesus does it. That's what grace is. It's a gift. Now, i got nothing to brag about. That's a miracle today. It's a miracle to me when I see a couple that desires to, to walk with God and they want to get married and they want to stay pure. I understand there's a battle that's going on. There's a battle, but not saying, forget you, we're just going to live together. Who are you to tell me what to do? In their accent like that. <laughs> I'm not the one who says it. That would be a miracle today. Let's keep going. Verse 9. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. Isn't that beautiful? This is so real. That guy just keeps talking. And the, I don't know if he was monotone or whatever. It was like the fumes of the, the lamp. He just almost out, you know. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story. And was taken up dead. Now, I don't know what was going on as Paul is speaking, or if anybody noticed that he was, you know, what was going on. You, somebody better grab Eutychus. He's going to go any minute, okay? Or if they're just so riveted because Paul's teaching. This word, even he sank, indicates a deep sleep. It sound, as the people that study this have said it's probably between 7 and 14 years old, guy. 
and Dr. Luke could make a decent diagnosis of his condition. This is a doctor that's writing this book. Look at verse 10. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. This event broke up the meeting. I know that may be shocking, but there, something's going on. <laughs> He fell out a window, three, three floors, and um, he lands, and he's, he, they run down there. Paul sees him, bends over him, and he goes, and by the way, he was dead. It wasn't like, he, it didn't say he, he was like he was dead. He's dead. I, by the way, I love resurrection stories in the Word. Aren't they great? Because resurrection stories in the Word sh- tell me, it's going to happen for me, too. It's going to happen. Because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me. Isn't that cool? We have a, a guaranteed, and so God, in his word, puts that in there. And he says he doesn't want them to be alarmed. Paul says that, this word, thorobio, no uproar. He will have life. He believes that there's going to be life. For life is in him, and it was. And some some have have speculated that it's saying things like, "Oh, that you know, he held him close to him." And it's like, "Oh, I could feel his heartbeat." He was dead, but God. Verse eleven. And when Paul had gone up, and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a little while until daybreak, and so departed. So this this young man resurrected. They go. They kept the meeting going. Teachings not over. Went back to fellowship and worship. Verse 12, and they took the youth away alive and uh, were not a little comforted. Remember we talked about that a little bit? Uh, double negatives. It could have said here as, as easily it should have said, and they were like extremely happy. But he does this sometimes in the word where he combines two negatives to make something very positive. They're not a little comforted. They are really comforted. They are fired up about what God has done. Must meet. We see miracles. Lastly, how do we confront spiritual narcolepsy? We should move. We should move. I, mean, I don't know if you've done that. When, you, when you're struggling to stay awake, I see you. Some of you do it too sometimes. You just get up. Don't do it now. But <laughs> there are times when, when that goes on, you, you get up and you just start to move around because you, you know. I, I've had that with, um, with the seminars that I've been at, especially after lunch. Steve and I are talking. We're trying to put the schedule together for the men's retreat that's coming up actually a month from, from today. We're excited about it, but we're putting the schedule together, and we start talking about how that schedule should be put together. And we say things like, okay, the, 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 there's going to be a meal on Saturday. It's probably packed with carbs because us men, we gather at the buffet because we buffet our bodies, the Bible says. <laughs> Buffet our bodies. But anyways, <laughs> I, I, I read it the way I want to. And, um, <laughs> but you, you eat all this, stu- you know, breads and things like that. And then, and then the meeting starts and you're like, you're Mr. Bean. Amen. And, and so we're putting schedule together. How to make it so that, you know, so that's why I'm glad we meet before lunch because you got something to look forward to. And uh, I don't have zombies, you know, um, while, while we're teaching here. So we, we move. We should move. And spiritually, we should move. Look at verse 13. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul ab- aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. This city was located 20 miles south of Troas. The by land was because the ship had to sail around the peninsula. He could have arrived sooner, not long after that, but he chose to walk there. And you know why he chose to walk there? Remember that day when um, James and Eugenie and Sarah were up here and we were describing the love that Paul had for the church and, and things along that line? And in that culture, there were times when they would leave people 
And people would actually travel with them a day, maybe a day and a half, and then they would say goodbye to them there and then go back to where they're from. He is so in love with these people. Isn't it cool when you love, love the body of Christ, the church? I don't know if you've ever had that, where you're on vacation. You're ever on vacation, no? and I remember back in the day, there were people that would be so bound by wanting to make sure a pastor knew that they were behaving. That they, I remember, and I'd see this as a kid. I'd see these guys come in, and they have a bulletin from the church that they were at when they were on vacation. Hey, pastor, I just want you to know. I was good. I went to church while I was on vacation. All right? God's like, amazing. You, know? um, <laughs> you, are, you are better than all the rest. Right. Um, but it was one of those things where if you do that out of a proper motive, and there's been times where we would do that, and it wasn't like, look at us, we're so amazing. But when you get into a body of Christ someplace else, it's so cool, isn't it? You meet these people and you don't, know, you don't know them at all, but because you have the bond in Christ, you actually can talk about these things and you're excited and what's going on in their church and you, and you see all these different things and you just, you just, it happens. And you're not doing it so I get, I, okay, by the chance, do you have any bulletins because i got to report back to my dad. <laughs> it's just because you love people. That's what I think Paul was like. He had just he had just taught till midnight. The guy drops, heals him. Then he teaches till daybreak. Then he walks with them, and they're still. But what about him? And they're probably talking. What about Jesus? And they're just spending this time together. What's but what is, how's this work in my life? And how, and he's just able to talk, and he's just loving. It's just they're living life together. It's not <laughs> chanting and oh Paul, Paul's amazing. What? It's, he's just loving them. Continues to teach the believers from Troas who accompany him. Look at verse 14. Metasodasos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. Mytilene was the leading city on the island of Lesbos. Verse 15. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. Chios was the birthplace of Homer. It's interesting, as you do study in these things, it would be, it's, it is so, they're just living life that they're not bound by. And by the way, Chios, and it was the home of Homer, who's amazing. It's, he just cares about the people in Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos, which is the home of Pythagoras. And the day after that, we met, we went to Miletus. So it looked like a pattern that was going on as they would sail, as they would walk, as they would take these trips 30 miles and then stop, spending the night 30 miles and stop, 30 miles and stop. They're just living life. Can you imagine that? 30 miles each day. I was thinking, that's a half hour for us on the highway. We are so blessed. We just, we just zoom past places. And, and by the way, I like it. I want you to know, I like it. I like getting places and stuff. But you ever stop and you find these hole in the wall places? I'll watch like, uh, what's the show about that guy cooking? Um, drive-ins and dives. You ever watch? <laughs> I love how you guys know this stuff. It's so cool. Uh, I say a scripture reference. No, never mind. Um, but no, but you go, yeah, I, I'll watch this thing and you'll watch that food and you go, you know what? When we go on vacation, I want to go to that place because that food is And that's what I, I see with this, that kind of life, where life will slow down a little bit. And, and they get a place, and it's like, as Paul is spending time in, with these people, that he's looking forward to that. We're going to stop at this home, and they're going to have this meal that's just going to be fantastic. And, we're gonna, and then we're going to be able to spend more time together. It's, a, it's, it's so great, this Christian walk, this Christian life. Let's lastly, let's look at verse 16. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have t- to spend time in Asia. For we, he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. He is, he is wanting to get... The, remember he was taking offering for the church in Jerusalem? He had gone and, and he had all of these, these different people with him on that trip that were going with him as representatives of these churches and what they gave. And ultimately, they're going to give 
to this church in Jerusalem. It is so excellent because what was going on, these are all Gentiles. For the most part, they're Gentiles who have fallen in love with Jesus Christ. Their lives have been changed, and they heard about the church in Jerusalem that is struggling, that is hurting, that has needs. And these Gentiles are going to show up, and as representatives of different churches say, we did this because we love you. We did this because we love you. It's humbling. You ever receive gifts from someone? You're just humbled. Why would they even think of me? It's the love of God. Love of God in Christ. This is what helps with spiritual narcolepsy. We get moving. We meet. We see miracles. That's, that's what's going to help us wake up. We take this stuff seriously. Let's pray.